Hello, I'm David Tabb. I'm a professor at Stellenbosch University in Cape Town, South Africa. I am part of the Division of Molecular Biology and Human Genetics, and today I'm going to take you through some of the bioinformatics of gene expression. This will be a six-part series, uh, with each part about 10 to 15 minutes. So I hope that you'll join with me in understanding how we can measure gene expression and then how we make sense of the data we produce. This section is going to deal with the why question. Why would we bother to measure gene expression? What is the information that gene expression measurements can contribute? We'll move from there to talk about a little bit more concretely about transcripts. Transcripts are the, the, the key focus of much of gene expression. So how do we produce messenger RNAs in prokaryotes and eukaryotes? And then from there, we'll start to talk a little bit about cDNA. This is complementary DNA that we frequently measure more directly, uh, measure directly instead of messenger RNA. So let's talk about the question of regulation, because regulation and gene expression go hand in hand. Gene expression is always highly regulated. There are lots of mechanisms by which that takes place. We know that in the, the human genome, we have around 20,000 genes. Which genes are turned on or off in a given, a given sample can differ rather tremendously. So we start with the idea of a mutant cell, a mutant cell versus a wild type cell. If you have a cell in which um, a, a gene involved in regulation is mutated, all of the targets, all of the genes that it directly um, controls are going to vary in, in their expression levels in response to this very targeted mutation. So a mutation versus a, a, a wild type cell is going to illustrate different patterns of gene expression. You may also find, though, that a particular cell is going to alter its expression in response to a stimulus. Now, the examples we have here are, are three pretty common ones, drugs, light, and sleep. So if you have a cell that's being uh, st stimulated by uh, a stimulant, you <laughs> that's a rather silly thing, but you, know, you behave differently when you're stimulated by caffeine, right? Well, your cells are responding uh, to drugs like that all the time. Similarly, uh, you may react to light. We see that, for example, single cell organisms may respond to light. Uh, they may exhibit phototaxis, swimming towards light. So something like that is an example of a uh, way that expression can alter in response to light. And finally, sleep, of course. You as a multicellular organism need all of the eight hours of sleep that you get every night. If you sleep four hours and that very irregularly, uh, the, the genes in your body are going to behave differently. They're going to express differently, and you're going to uh, exhibit phenotypes that, that may include an awful lot of yawning. All right. Next, we can think about different developmental stages. One of the organisms that we've studied most uh, closely in response to this is the C. elegans worm. Uh, this is just a, a very small worm. Um, it's got a certain number, I think hundreds of different cells. And we see that as this worm develops, different genes are turned on and off. Some genes are only turned on at very early stages of development. So you might imagine that among your 20,000 genes, you have several that really haven't been springing into action since you were an embryo. Certainly likely. Um, next, we can, can consider different cell types. Now, the, the fibroblasts, the, some of the cells in your skin, have the ex exact same genome as your muscle cells do. And yet, which genes are turned on, which genes are expressing in your skin cells and in your muscle cells are dramatically, dramatically different. So this is one of the key ways in which different cell types differ from each other, by which genes are turned on. And finally, we can consider in disease states and in healthy states. So you have uh, cells in your pancreas that behave very differently if you have diabetes than if you have, uh, if you're wild type, if you don't have uh, that, that disease. So you can imagine that almost any number of possible phenotypes can be differentiated based on which genes are expressed in those cells and the extent to which they're expressed. So in a lot of ways, we think of measuring the transcriptome, of measuring gene expression, is very much uh, about not only which genes are turned on, but by magnitude as well, by 
how many messenger RNA copies are being produced from a given gene. So this is not just a on-off question, but also a magnitude question. Now, why would we focus on transcriptomes rather than genomes? It, it's true that you can measure some questions about expression from a genomic point of view, specifically from an epigenomic point of view. Some genes are more methylated than others, and as a result are silenced, or are, are turned off by uh, these epigenetic effects. But more generally speaking, if you want to understand transcription, uh, if you want to understand the, the amount of expression, doing it in the transcriptome makes a lot of sense. Messenger RNA molecules are, uh, are kind of an, a direct expression of how much this gene is being active at this point in time. Now you could argue that we could go further than the transcriptome. We could, we could stop measuring messenger RNA and instead focus on polypeptides and proteins. That would put us in proteomics, which is another step for, uh, closer to phenotype. Finally, we get to metabolites, things like carbohydrates and lipids and amino acids. These, these molecules are all examples of the kinds of, of analytes that are part of the biological, uh, biochemical reactions that are phenotype. So we, th we can think of each of these stages, genomics, transcriptomics, proteomics, and metabolomics, as getting us ever closer to the true phenotype of, of a sample. Now, what is the, the biochemical nature of transcripts, of messenger RNAs? They're quite different when we look at prokaryotes, like bacteria, and eukaryotes like us. So in this slide, we're looking at prokaryotic transcription. We are looking at something we call an operon, uh, or, or a polycystronic operon in this case. So we have multiple open reading frames. You see those marked in red here by ORF. That's an open reading frame. So multiple open reading frames can be strung together in a single cistron, uh, in a single operon. So this collection of open reading frames are typically linked together in having common functions. We see that they share a common promoter that causes uh, the transcription of this whole stretch to be uh, generated. So we, we generate a messenger RNA that is an RNA copy of the coding strand of DNA. And then we see that there are multiple RBSs. These are uh, uh, ribosome binding sites on that transcript. So we see that multiple polypeptides, multiple uh, in this case, multiple proteins, are coded for by a single transcript. So this is an example of polycystron polycystronic uh, gene expression that leads to multiple proteins per transcript. That's quite different than what we see in organisms that have membrane-bound organelles and organized nuclei, etc., eukaryotes. So eukaryotes, uh, have instead of having one transcript leading to multiple um, multiple proteins from different parts of that transcript, have this combination of exons and introns that are part of these open reading frames, here shown as these red and white alternating bars. So we see that we can take different paths through the exons to create different isoforms, different transcripts from a single gene. And each of those transcripts, in turn, will relate to a single polypeptide, a single protein product. So here we have uh, a pre-messenger RNA that's transcribed. Some splicing events take place, and that leads to a mature messenger RNA that is then translated. Now, I mentioned a while ago that a lot of the measurement in gene expression is not, for, uh, is not based on the, the messenger RNA directly, but instead works from something called a complementary DNA. And the reason for this is that RNase is everywhere. RNase is a, 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 a type of enzyme designed to digest up uh, messenger RNAs. So cells don't routinely keep a single messenger RNA around for a very long time, unless it's in some sort of protected form. So this, the, the messenger RNAs can be digested up pretty quickly. We want to protect them then by making a complementary DNA from them. So for this, we would probably stick a primer somewhere close to the, to the, 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 the end of the, the messenger RNA, and we're then going to create a complementary DNA that is complementary 
to the messenger RNA strand. So this reverse transcription process creates a complementary DNA. While we're doing this interaction, we may choose to amplify to make many more copies of that cDNA. So we might use polymerase chain reaction as a way to do that, to create, um, uh, to double the number of copies of this cDNA that we have at each round of PCR. So what do we hope to learn from this? In the end, we would like to know uh, which genes are differentially expressed between cohorts. Maybe you have some cases and you have some controls and you want to know which genes differentiate the two. That's a, a pretty classic kind of example of, of a, a differential transcriptomics experiment. You might also have some samples of known type. These are cases, these are controls, and some samples of unknown type mixed together. And you want to see, uh, do these unknown samples group together with the cases or with the controls with, with, uh, that you have known in your sample? You might also ask the same question, though, from the, of the genes. So which genes uh, group together? Or which genes have correlated expression by the samples that we're analyzing? So you can group in both, in both uh, orientations. You can group together the samples with similar gene expression, and you can group together the genes that are similar across samples. And finally, we have what we call the biomarker question. So which genes, which genes are useful in clinical decision making? You may, for example, have uh, many, many women in a sample that all have breast cancer, but you're trying to decide which of the people are going to respond well to this drug or that drug. You may need to de decide based on the genes that they have, which ones uh, should be in, which, in, in each of these treatment cohorts. So for something like that, we seek biomarkers. And gene expression is frequently used as a way to pursue biomarkers. Okay, so I hope this helps you get started with understanding why gene expression is a useful pursuit. And in the next, uh, the next talk, we will discuss what are the technologies that we use in order to do gene expression evaluation.